Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be with my good friends, Dr. Prasanna Kumar from Bangalore. We were just together in December. And with Sanjay Rajgopalan from Baltimore, originally from here. And it's a particular pleasure for me to be here in Chennai because it was 30 years ago this year I first came to India. Uh, and it was to this city of Madras then to look at a conference on nerve damage and foot problems in diabetes and leprosy. So it's a pleasure to be back and to see the wonderful progression that has uh, occurred over the last uh, 30 years. So I'm going to <clears throat> look at the 21st epidemic of type 2 uh, diabetes and I don't need to remind this audience that for the first time in our history non-communicable diseases have become the leading cause of global mortality and morbidity. But as my good friend Clive Cockrum said at the end of his talk, we cannot forget about infectious diseases because these are clearly are extremely important. If we look at the physical atlas of the world, this is how it looks. But if we change this according to the distribution of population, it changes to this, uh, of course, and we see uh, a great number of people living in Asia, especially India and China. If we look at the map in the same way, uh, according to the distribution of diabetes, we see again the, the concentration of type 2 diabetes particularly uh, in this part of the world. And it was thought then, when this slide was made, that India was number one, China number two, and North America, USA number three. But it was, uh, this was the, these were the data, and it was thought, as I said, India number one, China number two. But it was the appearance of this paper from friends in China. This was a good um, population-based study published just a few years ago. Uh, and th this showed us that if you look at diabetes in China, the percentage with diabetes, it was almost 10% at this period of study, suggesting, therefore, that China is, in fact, number one in terms of numbers of people with diabetes. And the worrying feature was that only a minority of patients in this study were actually known to have diabetes at the time of study. Most were found. We travel the world and we see the problems. This I picked up with the Gulf News on the way to lecture in Dubai a few years ago. Cases of diabetes growing faster than projected. The Middle East, the world capital of diabetes in terms of prevalence figures. But not only there, also we see in Western European countries, this I picked up on the flight from Manchester to our headquarters of ESD in Dusseldorf. Those of you who don't speak German, die Süße Falle, the sweet trap, talking about the, the explosion of diabetes in Germany. And it's not only type 2. These data from Finland, which has the highest incidence, of course, of type 1 diabetes, show that type 1 diabetes is also continuing to increase faster than ever before. So we really have a war against diabetes. And in any war, there are going to be a lot of casualties. And there will be many battles. And we are fighting those uh, all the time. Indeed, uh, just next week I'll be at a meeting looking at diabetes uh, with some people from here, this country, uh, at the WHO in Geneva. And the message for our governments and the world at large is we cannot ignore diabetes, not only because it's so common and the, so the prevalence of morbidity is very high, but also it's very expensive. And you see here, uh, in some countries, up to 40% of the healthcare budgets are accord, accounted for by diabetes. And of course, a lot of this is due to the late complications. So we, with, together with our very good friends at the American Diabetes Association, recently updated our guidelines that were first published uh, a few years ago on the management of hyperglycemia, a patient-centered approach. And if you look here at our colleagues in hypertension, starting in 1950, we had a gradual increase over all the years uh, in the last 60 years of the number of agents that are available uh, to treat hypertension. What about diabetes? Of course, uh, 1922, the discovery of insulin, and later, sulfonylureas and biguanides, but in the United States, not here and not in Europe. Uh, they were withdrawn, of course, because of fears about lactic acidosis. And then for many years, we were really looking at, at, in our countries metformin, sulfonylureas, and insulin, that was it. But in recent years, there has been an explosion 
And if you look here, the development of new drugs for the management of type 2 diabetes, uh, you see this uh, explosion of new agents with more to come. So we felt that there was a need in view of this for a patient-centered approach to the guidelines for the management of type 2 diabetes. And you can download these free of charge published a couple of months ago in Diabetes Care in our journal, Diabetologia. And updated specifically the oral agents and non-insulin injectables. And of course, this was updated, the initial strategy and how to advance the dual or triple uh, combination therapies. But we also need, and this is a very patient-centered approach, to take into account uh, age, weight, other comorbidities particularly. And we emphasize the patient-centered approach, providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, that gauge the patient's preferred level of involvement and exploring with the patient what therapeutic choices exist. Shared decision-making is ideal. We don't want the external locus of control to predominate where the patient comes in and says, whatever you say, doc, will do. That is the past, perhaps not the future. And of course, type 2 diabetes is a multiple complex pathophysiological abnormalities. And we see, uh, we've just heard from Sanjay talking about the increasing effects. Uh, we see, of course, the central effects, decreased peripheral glucose uptake, increased hepatic glucose production, and so on. And we have a bunch of new therapies uh, that are increasingly used that tackle various of these pathophysiologic abnormalities. So, in our re revised guidelines, we're looking at glycemic targets of less than 7%, ideally, but of course taking into account the individual patient's needs. Preprandial less than 7 millimoles per litre, other times less than 10. The tighter targets should be restricted to those with younger, healthier, and looser targets for the older patients who may have significant comorbidities. And this is uh, been revised from our original paper in 2012. Of course, more stringent control according to short disease, uh, disease duration, increased life expectation, uh, risks associated with hyperglycemia, etc. So our approach to the management of hyperglycemia, we should consider what are the risks associated with hypoglycemia. If they're low risks, we go for more stringent control, but higher risk, less stringent control. Similarly, disease duration, shorter disease duration, more stringent uh, near normal glycemia, if you will. Life expectancy, if short, less stringent. Remember the words of George Bernard Shaw, who wrote in The Doctor's Dilemma, when he was nearing his, the end of his life, you see he lived a good long life, don't try and live forever because you will not succeed. And frequently we forget this. You know, we see an 85-year-old patient who's got significant cardiovascular disease and the junior doctor says we've got to get that glycated hemoglobin down to 7%. That could be dangerous in many ways. And remember, and this comes from my good friend Spence Taylor, a vascular surgeon, human life is a sexually transmitted disease with 100% mortality. So remember this when we're treating the patient in front of us. If there are important comorbidities, particularly cardiovascular disease, uh, then we need uh, to be less stringent because there are potential dangers. If there are no vascular complications, of course, we want to prevent the development of complications, especially microvascular complications, where there is no doubt that good glycemic control reduces the incidence. And again, we need to remember that this is potentially modifiable, but it can take a while. Patient attitude and expected treatment effects, most important. And of course, what are the resource and support systems that we have? So in terms of anti-hyperglycemic therapy, therapeutic options, of course, starting with healthy diet, increased activity levels, and I see that the escalator coming up here is broken. Perhaps that's deliberate by Diabetes India to increase exercise uh, to make us walk up the stairs. But however, remember the words of Henri de Montville, nothing is new in medicine. He wrote these words in 1320. Anyone who believes that anything can be suited to everyone is a great fool 
because medicine is practiced not on one kind, but on every individual patient in front of you. And we need to remember that as well. Guidelines are great, but take into context that patient's individual needs. So, I'm going to focus on the drugs that are widely uh, available on this side. And we know how they work by guanides, sulfonylureas, thiazolidine diones, TPP4 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors. These are the new guys on the block, if you like, in our guidelines. And we know we've heard a lot about GLP-1 receptor agonists and, of course, insulin we've had uh, for nearly 100 years. So, after healthy eating weight control, increased physical activity and education, first-line drugs remain as the baguana, sulfonide, uh, metformin. Low cost, highly efficacious, and safety is known for many years. Then the add-on and second-line drugs include all of these, and we have the SGLT2 inhibitors here uh, as well. Now, I spoke at the launch of uh, DAPA in the UK, and I said I always teach my medical students you must use the proper name for a drug unless you can't pronounce it, and then you can use the trade name. Well, for this one, I can't pronounce either, so I let them use whatever they want. But there are many of these SGLT2 inhibitors available now, and they appear certainly to be very promising. So we have a number of possibilities to add on both second and uh, third line uh, therapies. And these you'll be familiar with if you've read our guidelines in January issues of these journals. If there's metformin intolerance or contraindication, then we move to one of these as a first line, of course. And especially if patients are poorly controlled, we might go straight to dual therapy. These are to avoid hypoglycemia. The add-ons could be a thiazolidine dione, pyoglitazone, TPP4, STLT2, or GLP-1 agonist. And again, uh, if we want to avoid weight gain, the add-ons uh, could be these three here. Costs are very important. In our healthcare service in the UK, we're very cost conscious. Uh, and of course, therefore, if you're concerned with cost, metformin is low cost, so are the sulfonylureas, and so are the thiazolidine diones now, and insulin variable. And then we move on to the insulin in our guidelines, and I won't go through these because you're very familiar with this, and this is not a lecture on insulin uh, therapy. And then, of course, we finalize what about comparative effectiveness research looking at the importance of clinical outcomes. So the key points of the revised guidelines is that we're adding in SGLT2. Uh, glycemic targets and blood glucose therapies must be individualized. This is most important, as I've tried to bring out throughout this talk so far. Metformin remains the optimal first-line drug, and there are a number of, number of others, including SGLT2s, which might be second-line add-ons. Ultimately, as we found out from many studies, particularly UK PDS, most patients eventually will require insulin, uh, either alone or in combination with others. All treatment decisions should be made in conjunction with the patient, and it isn't just a disease of hyperglycemia. Of course, we need comprehensive cardiovascular uh, risk reduction. Update on some new data on alogliptin, the DPV4 inhibitor. And this now, in a study produced, uh, published in just a few months ago by my good friend Stefano Del Prato from Pisa and colleagues, suggests that this is, uh, also uh, has benefit over uh, sulfonylureas in a long-term study. So this is the ENDURE study, and this is where it was published in December. The durability and efficacy of the safety of alogliptin compared with uh, sulfonylurea in type 2 diabetes, a uh, add-on study to metformin. Patients were randomized either to alogliptin 25, 12 and a half, or glipizide plus metformin, and were followed for two years. And we see that the rapid in, uh, effect of the DPP-4 inhibitor is sustained over time. Uh, and in green here, we have the glipizide, and you see a significant benefit of alagliptin over a glipizide at the two-year follow-up stage. Greater reductions are also observed in the fasting glucose, fasting plasma glucose in both doses of alagliptin you see here, compared with the sulfonylurea. 
And you also, not surprisingly, see a benefit in uh, weight. Uh, and, and you see here the DPP4 and here weight gain with glipizide. And, and also, not surprisingly, uh, there's decreased postprandial glucose and, of course, particularly non surprising, less hypoglycemia. So it appears that both doses of allogliptin showed sustained antihypoglycemic efficacy over two years in those who were inadequately controlled on uh, metformin. And we see this superiority in post hoc analysis, one should point out, of allogliptin over glipizide in obtaining better glycemic control without weight gain. And I should point out this one as well. It was a few years ago when we were at the ADA in Chicago that this hoo-ha about DPP-4s, GLP-1s cause cancer. The press, bad news is great press. Diabetes drugs cause cancer. The ADA and EASD together, we put out a statement saying we were not convinced by these data and there needs to be further work. Our actions were vindicated because the follow-up studies published in the New England Journal Review First time ever in a major journal, a review by the FDA together with the European Medicines Authority, EMA, could not conclude that there was any increased risk on these agents of developing pancreatic cancer. But have we seen all this in the press? Diabetes drugs are actually safe? Of course not. It doesn't make good press. It doesn't sell newspapers. And we need to remember that uh, with the next topic, and that is pioglitazone. Again, pioglitazone causes bladder cancer. This drug was even withdrawn in your country, I know, and was then rehabilitated. Diabetes mellitus is, of course, and you've had a symposium on this already here, the risk of diabetes, increased risk of cancer. It's an extremely complex area. Of course, bladder uh, cancer occurs in this number of patients with diabetes. And there are so many potential confounding variables uh, that many of us were concerned that perhaps is this a true risk or is it not? So it was concluded that long-term studies, prospective studies with large numbers of patients needed to be performed. And the Kaiser Permanente, which is a, an HMO-like organization, uh, and this is the Californian one, gave the opportunity to study for 10 years a large cohort of patients to see if there was a re real risk, increased risk of bladder cancer with pioglitazone. Here are the eight-year interim results, and I'm not going to go through this rather tedious slide with you. You'll be relieved to hear, but the take-home message is that this showed no association with pioglitazone use and increased risk of bladder cancer. And indeed, just recently, another paper was published uh, from the UK, from Scotland, uh, completely independent of this one or, or of the company, showing, again, no increased risk of bladder cancer uh, with treatment with pioglitazone. So I think we need to be very cautious when one or two studies suddenly suggest a huge increased risk of cancer, whether it be the study from Butler and colleagues of the DPP-4s and GLP-1 analogues, or whether it be uh, the problem with the um, pioglitazone and bladder cancer. So to summarize, no association has been shown with pio that has been closed. Now, of course, the reason for aiming for good control is particularly to reduce the risk of microvascular complications uh, as well as potentially, as you just heard from Sanjay, macrovascular complications in our patients with type 2 diabetes. But there is a major challenge that faces us, I would suggest. It's not just glycemic control. It's all the other associated features with diabetes that include hypertension, dyslipidemia, multiple therapies, polypharmacy. Do we address insulin sensitivity? Can we delay macrovascular? Can we delay microvascular complications? And it's easy to control diabetes in the short term but I would suggest to you that it isn't so easy to control diabetes in the long term. So I think this statement is true. We have the evidence. In many cases, we have the therapies. But the real challenge is putting evidence into practice 
that will indeed involve new systems of working, solving compliance issues and resource. So I will finish to say that we're celebrating this year, and this is this month's edition of, of Diabetologia. We are 50 years old this month. And indeed, in 10 days' time, I will chair the Executive Committee in Monte Catini in Italy, where the EASD was formed on the very same date, exactly 50 years ago. So I'll end by welcoming all of you to our 51st annual meeting, which will be in Stockholm this year. We're delighted last year in Vienna that India was in the top six of countries sending delegates. And we're always delighted to see merry Indian friends and colleagues at our annual meeting. As you know, Stockholm is a very nice city. It isn't quite as warm as Chennai, I should point out. And we have our online meeting as well. Stay up to date. We do look forward to welcoming you later this year to the beautiful city of Stockholm in Sweden. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor.